there's still a lot of stigma around being a black woman as a single mother. You get these like well, older women, just these looks of disappointment, like oh, you almost made it. You were in law school and damn it. I remember calling like friends being like, you're not gonna believe this, I'm pregnant. And they would just like laugh. They'd be like, girl, stop. Girl, we all know you don't even have sex. I'm like, <laughs> such a nerd. But I remember being that woman that was like, I'm in my 30s, already have a child. I just need to meet a nice guy that's going to help me raise a baby. That's exactly what I got. We had dated, we dated for six months before he proposed. He had been given an ultimatum by a beautiful woman and felt he's in his 30s. It's time for him to settle down and be serious. It's just like this recipe for disaster. You found mm -hmm. it hard to get employment. Yeah, man, there was no Black Lives Matter movement going no, on. Like, no, no. That. I remember the first career coach telling me like, ah, I think you have to take that Black Studies off your resume. I took it off. Sure enough, I started getting hits. What inspired the law school decision? So I was in, <laughs> I was in grad school majoring in Black Studies, which is around the time when you realize like, oh, this is why everyone was asking me, what was I going to do <laughs> with this degree, right? I was like, oh, so I only have one choice. I could just get my PhD and teach all, you know, like right. that was it. And that didn't, I don't know, it just wasn't appealing to me at the time. It just seemed so limiting. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like sure. I could always go teach. Um, and so I remember professors saying, she's like, I mean, look, you can either go get your PhD, or you can go to law school. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to law school. Like, no rhyme or reason other than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember taking the LSAT. I had also applied to a few grad schools, like, just in case. Um, and I'd gotten into, like, University of Wisconsin. I'd gotten into a school in Miami. And I remember contacting the LSAT to try and get my money back. So I didn't have to take the test. It's so embarrassing. Um, and they were like, you know, we it's the test is like coming up. We cannot give you your full amount back. We can just give you a portion. I was like, you know what? Forget it. I'll just take the test. Like I'm not, you know, ridiculous. So I take the test. I do well on it. I start getting all of these letters, you know, it was Cornell, it was this place, it was that place. And I was like, oh, maybe I should go to law school <laughs> and um, ended up wanting to stay in Ohio and started at a small school there called uh, Capital University Law School. Because, again, I had no idea like what schools, you know, like I didn't have anyone to guide me and say, like, no, you need to go to the most prestigious law school ever. I was like, this is super convenient. I won't have to move across country. This is going to be great. And they gave me a very generous scholarship. Um, and then around that time, uh, my stepfather, which my mom got married after I went off to high school. Another thing that I respect her for greatly, um, especially going to college and hearing so many horror stories from some of my classmates about what their stepfathers had done, you know, this whole nine. Um, so she waited until I was out of the house before she married. Apparently they were dating the whole time, but whatever, that's whole nother story. <laughs> so anyway, um, around this time, he uh, was diagnosed with total kidney failure. Um, and so I applied to transfer to a law school in Florida so I could be closer to home and then I ended up going to Stetson Law School. Um, uh -huh. And so... I had one little room with a friend of mine in grad school. One little room. I, one little room. <laughs> That's all and it I takes. To, it's all it takes. So I get down with Stetson and I'm moving out. I'm like, oh, I'm tired. Oh, it's just so <laughs> stressful. I was with so much. Where is it? Wait a minute. I'm like counting the days. I'm like, no way. Like, there's no way. Um, and yes, that was the way. And it was so funny because I, you know, I remember calling like friends being like, you're not going to believe this. I'm pregnant. And they would just like laugh. They'd be like, girl, stop. Girl, we all know you don't even have sex. I'm like, <laughs> you're such a nerd. You're such a nerd. You're not out here doing anything. Right. So it was like such a shock to everyone. 
Um, and I remember having to make this choice, right? Um, and, you know, it was a very quick, like, ah, I guess I'm about to be a mom. I mean, I was 27. I ended up having my, giving birth to my daughter and she, when I was 28. Um, and all of a sudden I was in law school with a baby. Wow. <laughs> was it was that a decision to be a single mom or were you trying to work it out and figure things out with the father? No, we, you know, we were friends um, and both very much, you know, held steadfast to like, just because we have this, ba- like, we didn't want to fall mm-hmm. into this trap of, okay. uh, you know, let's try and get, ma- let's try and make, right. like, no, we're pretend like it's more than yeah, what it was. Like, yeah. It's not, bro. So <laughs> we, um, and I think that helped as well too, right? Like it, we just were co-parents sure. from day one and partners in that respect. And he was still in grad school. Um, so he was still in Ohio. Uh, and I, you know, I was going it alone, you know? Mm. Um, wow. Which makes it an even bigger decision for you. Very big decision. Um, you know, and again, we're talking almost 20 years ago. There's still a lot of stigma around, you know, being a single mother, being a black woman as a single mother. Um, there was, de- you know, you get these like well, older women, just these looks of disappointment, like oh, you almost made it. You were in law school and damn it, you know, like, <laughs> so I know what a lot of that sort of thing Um but, you know, like she was born and just, it was almost like she knew mommy was in law school and that all she could, like, all I could handle was her being the happiest baby ever. Like we still joke, um, her dad does robotics and we joke that she's a robot. She was a robot baby. Cause she was so sweet. <laughs> she like never cried. She was so happy. Um, and she ended up being the law school baby. Um, in that, you know, when it was around finals time, everyone would come over to my house and be like, I just need that baby aromatherapy. I just need those good, <laughs> those good pheromones, you know? Um, so, yeah, you know, in retrospect, of course, this is me reflecting 18 years later, you know, it was a beautiful time. Um, not easy for sure. Um, but yeah, it could have been much, mm. much, much worse. I will say that, you know? Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. Yeah. So you have a law degree, you have a baby. And, uh, and you have uh, in your resume, it says you were an African-American major and you found mm-hmm. it hard to, to get employment. Like- yeah, man. They were like, what? <laughs> 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 what? There was, there was no black lives matter movement going no, on. No, no. About, you know? Um, yeah. And you said your and, faith wavered. What, what was the, what oh, was that man. like? You know, because I, again, and I really believed in, you know, just doing what you love. Right. And, and mm-hmm. felt that. It was very important for that had so much passion and joy um, around African and African American history, but there was nothing for me. And my, I, I was just like, "How did I end up here? Like, God, what? Like, what? Like, you couldn't tell. Like, you can just close this door sooner." So you know, and um, I remember the first, uh, you know, career coach telling me like, ah, I think you have to take that black studies off your resume. Just say, was that a black person or a white person who told you that? I don't even remember. I don't even remember. Um, I don't even remember, but it was probably, it was probably a white group, but I feel like I would have got the advice from anyone at that time. It was just like, girl, they are not the minute they see that is like next. Right. Um, and and did so, you have any hotep tendencies back then? Were you people <laughs> know that you were an African American <laughs> studies no, major just from having just, a five minute conversation I with was you? Not smelling like patchouli and you know <laughs> doing doing the thing out there. Um, no, I think you know it was it was very clear that I have had a love of history 
Mm -hmm. Um, I think anytime, you know, folks engage me in conversation, um, but no, there was no way, there was no way of, of telling that I I was a, you know, black studies major until you saw my resume. Um, and so I remember her telling me to like change that to the social sciences. And I was just like, this feels so, it just felt so deceitful. You know what I mean? And now she was like, no, like no law firm cares what you majored in in undergrad. But like when they see that, then they start caring. So I took it off and, um, yeah, sure enough, I started getting hits and the first law firm that reached out to me uh, was a small boutique law firm that did energy and environmental work. And it was on the plaintiff side, um, which meant there was some natural intersection there with, with race. And I was just like, Man, I could have kept my, could have kept it on my resume. But anyway, um, <laughs> it ended up being just a wonderful opportunity um mm-hmm. you know just doing like a lot of brownfields litigation like it was just it was amazing but then is that like um, Aaron Brockovich type of work <laughs> where people are class action I was, suits and yeah but I was more like Aaron Brockovich assistant got it you know what I mean <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, mean, I was fresh out of law school um And so, so yeah, so around that time, no one knew what energy and environmental law was. So think like early 2000s. And then all of a sudden, renewable energy became a thing. Like everyone was talking about renewable energy. Everyone was talking about the environment. Everything that we, you know, would say like, oh, that's crunchy granola people. That's what they do. All of a sudden, it was like a a national movement. And I was one of the few black woman in energy, which meant I could write my ticket, which meant I did because I had a toddler and I was still a single mom. And I was like, I'm going to work in big law. Um, so I went to a larger firm um, that was not doing plaintiff's work. They did a lot of project finance work. So think like wind turbine development, mm-hmm. solar panel development, but like early 2000s. And um, I made a lot of money. I worked a lot of hours. And I think that is when, like, my spending really, that's when it really started kicking in, right? Because it was, it was, I had the resources, you mm-hmm. know, as a way for me to escape reality. And e-commerce was just starting. So I could, like, order things online and have it delivered to the firm, which is so funny to think about how stuff would take, like, days back then right and now you, I could like order something right now and be like yeah I need that at five o'clock and it would be here but you, you know order the next 34 <laughs> minutes it'll right, be there you know, by seven o'clock tonight yeah so it'll be on your doorstep um but yeah the beginning of e-commerce and so yeah that is how I uh that was how my journey sort of started with accumulating all the things and then uh there's sort of a trajectory that a lot of lawyers follow if they don't end up going you know, from junior associate, mid-level to, you know, in the hopes of making partner, you realize that you get burnt out and you hate ball and you want to leave. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so you go, you know, big law to smaller law firm than the government, right? Mm-hmm. Like government is like this last sort of pit stop before you mm-hmm. figure out like what your true calling in life is. Um, mm-hmm. And so I remember, uh, you know, around the time uh, it was Barack Obama's uh, first uh, election season. And, you know, we were all like, we were just happy that, like, I never thought in a million years that we would even have a Black candidate. And then it became clear that he was going to win. And I'm like, NBC. And I was like, this is amazing. And I think, like, every Black person who had any sort of wherewithal in terms of wanting to work under this administration I mean, the, the day after he was elected, I was like, okay, where can I work, right? And um, was able to get a job at the Department of Energy. Again, one of the few Black women in energy, I could have gone wherever, right? Um, and it ended up just renewing my love for, you know, working with people and, and changing lives. And I worked in the Office of Weatherization. Um, so weatherization assistance, uh, they provide low in like low income homes with ret- energy retrofits to make their homes more energy efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just beautiful, 
meaningful work. Um, and around that time, I met my now ex-husband. And I remember just being really tired of being a single mom. I was exhausted. And I was like, I just need to meet a nice guy that's going to help me raise this baby. <laughs> that's exactly what I got. A nice guy that helped me raise my daughter. Um, what was the cute and- meet? How did you guys meet? Because there weren't any apps back then. Yeah, there were no apps. Um, do you know I still have not been on a dating app, but that's not a conversation <laughs> for another day. Um, but um, yeah, we actually met at a March Madness party um, mm. with one of the other uh, Black women attorneys that I knew. She was having that she was did not have a child, so she was always out in the streets. So she had like this big March Madness party at some nightclub or whatever, and. And we you met. didn't want to go, but she went at the oh, last you minute. Oh, know how you know the story. You know the story. No, I wanted to go. Um, I had a babysitter and I was like, I have a night out. Get you know? to get out. Yeah. I get to get out. And um, yeah, I met Joe and he was just the nicest guy. And I was like, he's a nice guy. We'll go out on a date. Um, and after like the second date, oh, so many. I don't even know if we have enough time for all these stories. But I remember... You know, being that woman that was like, I'm in my 30s, already have a child. The clock is ticking, right? And I remember telling him and saying, which is so frightening now, but I remember saying like, I'm not going to be dating you forever. So you need to figure out what you like. We're on our third date, you know? Um, So we, you know, we often share, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know each other. We had dated, we dated for six months before he proposed. Um had a very small wedding and you know had we dated longer we would have realized that we were better as friends as we are you know right now um and you know I had not thought about what I wanted and needed for myself as a woman only what I wanted and needed for myself as a mother Mm. you know he had been given an ultimatum you know Mm. by a beautiful woman and felt mm-hmm. he's in his thirties. It's time for him to settle down and be serious. You know, it's just like this recipe for disaster that I feel so many couples find themselves in. Um, mm-hmm. And some are able to make it work, and some, you know, are not. Mm-hmm. Um, so we sh- we ended up sharing our divorce story quite a bit to just sort of help other couples. We ended up being married for six years. Um, I think we both knew in year one, but you know, everyone's like, oh. It's always hard after year one. Oh, every marriage has it. You know what I mean? Like it took us a minute to just be like, you know what? Forget what everyone else is saying. Like this is just not working. Um, And I have a friend. I have a friend who told me she was together with her husband for 17 years before they got a divorce. And having, you know, again, being around your same age and being just being in the world for that long. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, so that means it probably started to deteriorate around 10 years in and you tried to hold on for seven yeah. years yeah. before you yeah. finally decided it's much and easier to let go than it is trying to keep so making this thing work. To, it is, but I understand also why so many people have the fear of doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much stigma and societal pressure to stay and make it work, to stay and mm-hmm. make it work, to stay and make it work. And I think when you're in a situation like uh, like we were in, which was there was no abuse. There was no, you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, he's a great guy. What are you doing? Make it work. And it's like, I'm not happy. He's not happy either, but mm-hmm. he don't even realize how unhappy <laughs> he is because well, we're both lying it's to interesting. ourselves. Yeah. And that's the theme of, of our current work, the min- our minimalism work, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with having all this crap, but right. if you let it go, you may discover that you actually weren't even happy with all the stuff that you accumulated and exactly. that actually there's some freedom in there for you to really hone in on what it is that you're inspired by and, and exactly. passionate about and all of that. So, so it's interesting to see that that was where, you know, that's just one little symptom that yeah. this, this minimalist inside of you was starting to awaken. It was starting to emerge. And I mean, we were like, right, you know, at the point of deciding like, yeah, we're going to get a divorce when when I actually started my journey, um, you know, you could only imagine how much stuff that I, more stuff that I brought when I had two incomes, right, to play around with. 
Um, and I was just like, we have too much stuff and I'm going to start decluttering. And like, it was, it was time. Right. And I, I tell but people before that, before that okay, you, you had rediscovered your passion for storytelling. Cause I want to get oh to the point goodness. where you're sitting yeah. in your home with no job writing, with starting no to realize looking. how much stuff you have. Right. Cause but, that's a key part of the story. It's a big part of the story. Me sitting in my house looking crazy, like what am I doing? Um, so around the time, uh, this was now just to give your listeners some context. This is now around like 2014. Mm -hmm. I realized that like, I am also unfulfilled in government. So this is also another part of making this transition. Right. And then again, I say like so many lawyers and so many professions, I think go through this. Um, and it just ends up leading you to your calling, but Anyway, uh, I was just very unfulfilled. I could do my, I could do my work with my eyes closed. And I had a friend say, you know what, we should do national novel writing month. And I was like, that sounds so nerdy. Even to a nerd, that sounds nerdy. Like, what is that? She's like, oh man, every November people around the world commit to writing a novel in one month. And I was like, that sounds so crazy, but yeah, let's do it. <laughs> And um, I ended up deciding to write a book about a theory that I had heard in grad school, which was that the spirits of slaves were not at rest and that they were embodied in the winds of hurricanes. Um, and so, you know, this was an opportunity for me to do all the historical research that I wanted to do. I looked at the top 10 hurricanes and looked to see if there were any corresponding moments in Black history that would justify mm. the rage of a hurricane. It was the most magical soul awakening journey ever, but we'll have to have wow. a whole nother conversation about it. it was, ah. So I start writing this book, doing this research and my soul is on fire. And I was mm. like, I forgot how much I loved writing. I forgot how much I loved research. I forgot how much I love focusing on African and African-American history. Right. So it awakened that and or reawaken that and i think once it was reawakened there was just no way that it could ever mm. be dormant and go to sleep again um and so i ended up indie publishing that book you know thinking hey i accomplished something it's amazing mind you to anyone thinking about national novel writing month it is a time to write the good first draft of a novel. You will not, <laughs> not the be final writing. draft. No, yeah. <laughs> it won't be print book. ready after <laughs> right, 30 okay. days. No caveat there. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I edited it for like a year, right? Yeah. Um, That's so but, interesting. Uh, so did you have a mentor that kind of walked you no. through that process? I had no mentor. I had no did your friend even continue Fiction, right? on beyond the month of November? No, she did not, which is like wild. I feel like she, you know, just like, and we met online. It's so weird. Like she just came into my life for that season mm -hmm. and wow. that reason. To get you to um, write your first book. To get me to street. write my first book. And it's so wild. Her name is Crystal. And she's always like, I'm so proud of you. Like we're still cool, you know, um, but she did not continue on. Um mm -hmm. But yeah, so I indie published this book and I like a big little book launch party, big little, you know, this is how we big. It was big for me, but it was small. So, a big so back, book then, back yeah. then you had Amazon uh, direct yes. publishing. So is that what you did? KDP? That's what I did. I did. Um, yep. I did KDP. Um, and I also did the print because like you could back then you could do so it was like, called create space. I think back then. Yeah, it was create space. That's what it was. Yeah. So I did create space. And then I did uh, the Kindle version of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just wild. I like found a cover designer online. And mm -hmm. anyway, it looked amazing. And 99 designs? Or no, thank you. One of those. Fiverr? No, like I Fiverr. Yeah. <laughs> you paid real money. I paid real money. Yeah. <laughs> so I always tell people, I'm like, I'm like, you know, I found this cover designer that also worked with traditional publishers and still works right. with traditional publishers. Um, and I bought a cover, I bought a pre-made cover because mm -hmm. I couldn't afford like, and then I'm like, this is not my career. Like I'm just going, let me find a mm -hmm. pre-made cover. But I had them do all the formatting and font. And, mm -hmm. and so it looked like, you know, a, a not self-published book, which back then indie publishing was not as hip, 
you know, right. and, and cool as it is today. Um, but anyway, so I have my big little book launch party. All my friends and family come. And I think I'm just going to go back to work, right? So then my friends start reading. And they're like, this is actually really good. I'm like, really? They're like, that's amazing. But you don't believe it when it's your friends, right? And so, mm-hmm. so people start leaving reviews. And then I start hearing from educators. I start hearing from professors. And they're like, I just want you to know I'm going to be using your book in my AFM 101. Class. And I'm like, wait, what is That's happening crazy. right now? Isn't that That's so crazy. Wild? And so the, then um, I get a call and uh, it's the woman who is now my agent. Like, are you represented? Would you like to seek representation? Yeah, you know, it's just like the wildest journey ever that mm-hmm. led me to to where I'm supposed to be. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.